Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم قال لا يأتيكما طعام ترزقانه إلا نبأتكما بتأويله قبل أن يأتيكما ذلكما مما علمني ربي إني تركت ملة قوم لا يؤمنون بالله وهم بالآخرة هم كافرون واتبعت ملة آبائي إبراهيم وإسحاق ويعقوب ما كان لنا أن نشرك بالله من شيء ذلك فضل ذلك من فضل الله علينا وعلى الناس ولكن أكثر الناس لا يشكرون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي فالحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين اما بعد once again everyone assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh uh, today i am going to try to cover some lessons from ayahs number 37 and 38 of surah yusuf uh, to catch you guys up because it's been a few days off in the middle uh, last i left you guys uh, we were talking about the ayah where Yusuf alayhi salam has entered the prison and he meets two inmates and they see something special in him and they decide to share a dream that they keep each each of them having a dream recurring that they come and tell him and say they just come out and say nabi nabi ta'wilihi tell us about what it means what's behind this this vision of ours inna naraka min al-muhsinin we without a doubt we see you from the kind of person that is muhsin and muhsin is then something i described to you in detail in the last session now it's time for Yusuf السلام, to respond to them. And his response is going to cover ayahs number 37, 38, 39, 40, 41. Um, and so that entire passage is actually Yusuf responding to them. Even though the interpretation of his dream is very, very short. Um, but he didn't start off telling them what the dream means. So what we're going to do today is look at the way in which uh, Allah recorded Yusuf salam's response and inshallah at the end of this uh, the, the prison episode when we go back to the biblical analysis you'll see that it's very different from what previous scripture you, you know uh, is record, is has on record in regards to this conversation uh, so in the Quran you have him calling them to Allah and using this opportunity to remind them of their maker but you don't have such a conversation in the Bible uh, so there is actually a pretty uh, significant difference when it comes to those two, but we'll get to that later. Let's get to the ayah itself. قَالَ لَا يَأْتِيكُمَا طَعَامٌ تُرْزَقَانِهِ He said, and at first I'll translate the entire portion of this ayah, because it's a long ayah, it's got several portions. So I'll translate the first portion, so make, we'll make sense of that, then move to the second portion. قَالَ لَا يَأْتِيكُمَا طَعَامٌ تُرْزَقَانِهِ إِلَّا نَبَّأْتُكُمَا بِتَأْوِيلِهِ قَبْلَ أَن يَأْتِيَكُمَا you, the food that is coming to both of you that you will be provided, that you are going to be provisioned with, will not come to you except that I will already have informed you of what it means, of what the dream or the visions you've had means. قَبْلَ أَن يَأْتِيَكُمَا Before it comes to you. So he says that before the food gets here, I'm going to have told you what the dream means. So let's break this down a little bit. Let's, let me set the scene for you before we go into the wording. They're in prison, and this is an ancient prison, which means this is not a pleasant place. You don't necessarily have, you know, uniforms, or you don't necessarily have, you know, prisoners' rights and things like that. Maybe even in modern prisons can be, a, you know, a, a glimpse of hell, but ancient prisons, you can imagine, were a pretty terrible place. Uh, it can be argued that they had, this, this is a dungeon or a cellar, so they have no access to sunlight, and they don't know what time of day or night it is. The only way they know what time... Things are is when the you know the, the gatekeeper opens the gate and food comes in, and even the food coming in may not actually be a you know consistent thing. Like they have a weekly schedule. Today we're gonna have soup, or tomorrow we're gonna have chicken, or whatever. Whatever they give you, they give you, and you eat, right? And we're gonna get to see hints in the in the language of the ayah how he's not even sure what's gonna come, and they don't they don't they're not sure when it's gonna come or what's gonna come. So there's kind of an, you know, an unknown when's the next time we're going to get fed type scenario inside of the prison. But they know that they've been hungry for a while and it's 
around the time where they're going to have to be fed. So now he's inside the prison. They find the opportunity to talk to him. They haven't eaten in a while. All of this is happening when Yusuf has just been put in prison. So he hasn't been in prison for several years when this happened. He just got in there. And the first thing I'd like you to notice is his state of mind. Yusuf is now entering for the second time in his life into a very dark place that he doesn't deserve to be in. And the first time he was thrown in a dark place where maybe he was beaten, slapped around, pushed down, yelled at by his brothers, and you could, he could see the hateful, murderous intent in their eyes. That, and, and we don't know how long he was down there in the well where maybe a, snuck, a snake is you know, touching up against him or you know, rats or mice are climbing all over him. There's no way for us to know what kind of experience he had inside of that well. And was he there for a day, two days? Did it rain? What, you know, was he half immersed in water? We don't know any of those things, but we know that it was incredibly dark. Ghayabat al-Jub. And that kind of an experience for a child can have a lasting impression. It can be something that becomes a trauma that they live with, the nightmares they, they have about it. And the first thing you have to note is when the option came of he's going to get thrown into jail, his mind, imagine, would go directly back to that same traumatic time where he was in that dark place. And if a person has experienced trauma like that, you would imagine they would say immediately, anything but that, I don't want that anymore. Especially because they were in that state even more helplessly as a child. And your mind will take you back to feeling like a child. You know, they, a lot of times when people go through uh, therapy and the process of healing and recovering from childhood trauma, in the course of therapy, even as they're talking to the therapist or their psychologist or whoever, they can actually feel like they're reliving the experience of five years old. They're reliving the experience of seven years old. They can, they can open up old wounds and become extremely vulnerable even if they're 35, even if they're 45, you know? So this is not a small thing. Human, you know, the trauma we experience as children or the experiences we have and how they impact our personality. So keeping that in mind, this is a pretty intense time for Yusuf salam from a psychological point of view. Yet from a spiritual point of view, and this is kind of the, the Qur'an's picture of on the one hand being sensitive to our emotional state and our traumas and all of it, and on the other hand illustrating that our faith is such a powerful force inside of us that even if we're traumatized, we're able to overcome it by divine intervention. Like the first time I realized that the Qur'an is painting a different picture of psychology because of its spiritual psychology, then conventional psychology is when I studied a little bit about the mother of Musa salam. The mother of Musa salam put her baby in the, the, you know, a moving river in a basket because Allah had revealed that to her. And when she put him in that basket and the basket rolled away, ask any mother if she's willing to put her baby in a basket in a body of water, a swimming pool for God's sake, a bathtub. What would a mother go through to, to allow herself to do that. And if, even if she did, and by the, t by the time she did, and she can't see the basket, you know, wavering around, moving back and forth, it can flip at any second, it can hit a rock, it can, you know, come into contact with a crocodile, whatever, because they had crocs in the river. And so that's gone, she can't even see it anymore. And Allah describes the state of her heart. He says, Wa asbaha fu'adu ummi Musa farighan. Mother, the Musa's mother heart was as if it was emptied out, like all emotions disappeared. She was completely overrun in the state of para emotional paralysis because of what's just happened. And she couldn't take it, right? That overwhelmed state where everything inside of you drains out is what she's experiencing at the time. It's the most terrible kind of anxiety. It's the most debilitating kind of anxiety. Some people that experience anxiety describe things like they can't even get up. Like they're lying down and they can't even get up. They can't even, like they, it's almost like they, they exist, but they cease to exist. And so Allah says, in kadat latubdi bihi. And when she did finally muster up the strength to get up, it's almost, she almost gave up her secret running after the baby. But if she did that, the baby would have absolutely have been killed, right? But how do you expect a mother to hold that in and not cry out for her baby? Allah says, now this is the part that got me thinking about this subject. لَوْلَا أَرَّبَطْنَا عَلَىٰ قَلْبِهَا Had we not tied or held firm her heart as if the heart is shattering, it's breaking into several pieces and Allah is taking rabt, a rope and He's literally tying it and holding it together from, from shattering, from exploding. Now this is divine intervention. A human being 
is not able to contain themselves in such a situation, but clearly Allah is describing لِتَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ So she can be from those who have faith. That our faith is something so powerful that it can even overcome a traumatic experience. And now this is the second time I'm seeing it in at least the stories of the Qur'an that I've been able to you know, understand this phenomenon in. Here you have Yusuf السلام, who has every reason to be absolutely in a panic attack when he hears he's about to go into prison because of what he went through in childhood. But the first words that come, of his, come out of his mind were Ma'ad Allah, I seek Allah's protection. I seek Allah's refuge. You're going to the most unsafe place and the first thing you're saying is actually I'm in Allah's safety. That's the, the first thought that comes in your mind. Then you're going to one of the most worst, the most horrible living conditions that imaginable at the time. I, I can't imagine a worse living condition than inside of a dungeon. And he says, إِنَّهُ رَبِّي أَحْسَنَ مَثْوَايَا My master has given good residence to me. He's been good for me as far as my living is concerned. As if he's saying, Allah has been good to me so far, there's no reason for me to think otherwise. And it's almost as if he's not saying, well, yeah, Allah put me in a well before, so I guess here's round two. <laughs> you know? And it's, oh my God, all over again, Ya Allah, why are you doing this to me? That's not his response. That's not the response of Iman. That's the, 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 that would be the response of ingratitude. So when, when someone focuses entirely on the negative experiences, now we have negative experiences, there's no way around them, and they have scarred us, but when we start attributing those negative experiences to Allah, and saying, why did Allah do this to me? Allah, you did this to me, and now you're doing this to me again, etc., etc., this is where someone can lose their iman. That is not the attitude of a grateful slave. One of the most amazing, shocking qualities of Nuh before I come back to this Nuh is obviously the role model in the Quran for patience, right? Because who, who did more preaching and who took more insults and who took more hits than Nuh 950 years, illa khamsina aman right? And how does Allah describe his career in a phrase? Like if you were to describe Nuh I would say the, a man of great patience, right? A man of great patience. But what does Allah describe him as? إِنَّهُ كَانَ عَبْدًا shakura. He was a servant extremely grateful. Instead of saying extremely patient, Allah said what? Extremely grateful. Why? Because Allah has given us a secret inside that phrase. That same secret that Yusuf السلام, understands. And what is that secret? Patience only comes to those who hold on to gratitude. You can only suffer through the most difficult circumstances and trials if you force, if your mind is programmed to think about what you should be grateful for. Look at Yusuf السلام, in this case study. He's, he's being thrown in jail, and as he's being thrown in jail, he talks about how he should be grateful how his housing has been good. It's the gratitude that's going to give him strength, you understand? And he's going to walk into prison. Now he's walking into prison, other inmates are getting beat up, it's getting darker and darker and darker. He sees the scary gates, he sees the guards insulting him, pushing him, whatever the heck they're doing. All of that stuff is happening, and in the middle of all of that, he should be so concerned about how he's now in an unsafe place, in a place where he can be killed at any time, any kind of harm can come to him. Those human fears are natural. The Iman doesn't get rid of those fears. He's feeling those fears. And of course, he's now finally in a place where every man for himself. Everybody for himself. If there's one place that's like, you know, everybody's just a, you know, a, literally a reptile, reptilian brain, everybody's just looking out for themselves to snatch up whatever they can, that would be it, that would be the environment. And yet, the way he carries himself gets two inmates to come to him and ask him for, you know, for, their, for his help. And he now says, now let's focus on his words, لا يأتيكم الطعامون Food will not come to you. Now, ta'amun is nakira, which means it's in the indefinite. It doesn't have the definite article, the food or food. It means some food. Now, this could mean generally you can use, not use the alif lam, and it means just, you know, when it, before lunch comes to you or whatever lunch is coming, it could suggest that we don't even know what they're going to feed us this time. That's one meaning of it, which also kind of adds to the horror of this prison. What are they feeding us? What goop do we have to eat this time? Is scary, right? The other is, even if they know, even if it's the same single meal every single time, even if it's the same, you know, you know, you know uh, slushy thing, whatever they have to eat every single time, even then, Yusuf السلام, is actually acknowledging that the next meal is not guaranteed. Whatever food comes that you are going to be provided with, before it comes, you know, he, he's actually suggesting his, his uncertainty about what's coming in the future. 
even in these words, he's acknowledging something. He's acknowledging that food, what kind of food is it and when it's going to come, I don't know. But before it gets here, I promise you that I'm going to be telling you whatever you ask me about, I'll give you the answer to it. The other interesting peculiar thing is he's also a, a, an inmate. Yusuf is also an inmate, so he's going to get food too. But he didn't talk about his food, he talked about their food. He said, the food that both of you are going to be given provision of, before it gets here, I'll tell you what your dream means. Before it gets here. And it won't come to you unless I would have already told you. So he's kind of giving them a guarantee that I'll take care of your need. I've heard you. I've heard your dream. Instead of saying, listen, um, I can't help you. Just leave me alone. Or listen, I don't want any trouble. Kind of leaving them aside. Leaving them aside. The fact that they came to him. He's taking the opportunity to not be afraid of them. And he should be afraid. They are criminals. And he doesn't know what kind of criminals. He doesn't know if that's a serial killer or whatever else. He doesn't know. But he, because they approached him a certain way, he decides that he's going to engage them in conversation. And first thing he does is he comforts them. Lets them know, listen, you have asked me for something. And I take it pretty seriously. And I intend to tell you everything you want to know. And you won't have to wait that long. It'll have to be, there's no way that the next meal will come to you without me having already told you. So you'll, you'll know already. So, إِلَّا نَبَّعْتُكُمَا بِتَعْوِيلِهِ Except that I would have informed both of you of what the, what the interpretation of this dream is. Now, some scholars did argue that the, the ta'wilihi, its interpretation is actually referring, the it is not referring to what they saw, that the it is referring to the food. And they interpret it differently, this ayah. They say that Yusuf said, listen, I'm going to tell you what food is going to come today before it gets here. Which, and they say this is part of the miracle of Allah to him That he was able to tell what food is coming um, You know, Ibn Ashur rahimahullah and, and Tahrir wa Tanweer Kind of argues what I was thinking anyway That that seems off topic It seems away from the language of the ayah Plus, in the previous ayah they used Ta'wilihi bi ta'wilihi And then he says Nabba'tukuma bi ta'wilihi He uses exactly the same words The people that were sitting there listening to him These two men, young men They would have understood it to mean what they asked about not the food. Like I'm not I'm telling you today you're gonna to get tomatoes or cucumbers or whatever. That's not what he said. He's saying before the food gets here, I'll tell you what the dream means. He assures them again before it comes to both of you. The other interesting thing here is rizq. Right? He didn't just say before food gets here. He said before food that you are going to be provided with. You are going to be provided. That's the passive form. What does passive mean? For those of you that aren't into English grammar, I understand. English grammar is about as entertaining as getting a root canal. So it's understandable that you don't like English grammar. Um, but here's the thing about grammar in this ayah. The passive form means if I say someone was killed, someone was killed, then I didn't mention the killer. If I say they were both provided food, right? I didn't mention who provided it. I'll just know that it's being provided. So when he says, food that you are both being provided, or you, food that you are both going to be sustained with, he's actually not mentioning the provider on purpose. Because he's actually kind of, by these subtle words, he's getting them to start thinking, why did he not mention the guard that will give us food? Or the, the, you know, the, the people that deliver the food, the delivery people will give us food. Why did he say the food that you are going to be provided with? As if he wants me to ask the question, who's providing this food? Who's behind the guard? The guard didn't make the food, the cook made the food. But the cook didn't make the food, the cook received the ingredients. And the one who delivered the ingredients got them from a farm. And the farm got them from the land. And the land is, you know, couldn't have gotten it by, before, without the rain. And the rain couldn't have come, you know, أَنْتُمْ أَنزَلْتُمْ بُوهَا مِنَ الْمُزْنِ أَمْ نَحْنُ الْمُنزِلُونَ Are you the one who send the rain down from the clouds, from the loaded clouds, or do we do that? Like it goes back to who? Allah, and he's already getting them to, he's not saying it directly, he's saying food that you were provided, a very subtle kind of a drop in the pond that should create ripples, provided by who? And so he's already kind of prepping them to get to know Allah a little bit. And the first thing he wants them to know about Allah is your food should remind you of God. Your food should remind you that there is someone feeding you, right? And that's a very powerful notion in the Quran, you know. فَلْيَنظُرِ الْإِنسَانُ إِلَىٰ طَعَامِهِ Then the human being should take a good look at his food. أَنَّا صَبَبْنَا الْمَاءَ صَبَّا ثُمَّ شَقَقْنَا الْأَرْضَ شَقَّا 
فأنبتنا فيها حبا وعنبا وقضبا وزيتونا ونخلا وحدائق غلبا وفاكهة وأبامة علكم ولينعامكم He said, a person should take a good look at their food. We sent the water from the sky. We tore the earth open. Then we put the, you know, the, the seed got to sprout. And then all kinds of fruits and grain came out. And then, you know, zaytun and olive came out. Palm trees came out. And all manner of fruit came out. And grass rolling green and fields come out because of that. So that you can consume and your animals can consume. Because you consume the food on the ground and you consume your animals. You couldn't have had your beef. And you said, no thanks, I'm vegetarian. No, no thanks, I don't eat vegetables. I just eat my beef and chicken. Your beef and chicken wouldn't survive if Allah didn't provide them food from the earth. So you can't, you know, in the end, it's the earth that's feeding. And Allah is feeding that earth. So this is Allah teaching us that actually a, the, the most powerful notion of gratitude you know, if, if, your, if your child went out of their way to make lunch for you, surprisingly, right? Or provided you food, you, the, the, the words of thanks just come out of our mouth. Thanks, you know? And so Allah is taking that credit. At the end, all of our food is attributed back to Him. And that's kind of the small droplet that He's placed inside of their minds when He says, Tur zaqanihi. And so now they're still waiting for what, this dream, what these dreams could mean. And he's so sure that he can tell them quickly. He didn't say, let me think about it for a couple of days. I'll get back to you. Hmm, that's an interesting one. You know, he didn't say any of that because he's not going to think about it. This is revealed to him. This is something, this is divine knowledge that Allah has given him. So what does he say? That both of you, I'd like to say, is from the kind of knowledge that my master has taught me. Meaning, the reason I'm able to tell you so quickly is because I didn't come up with this myself. It was taught to me. And who taught it to me? My master taught it to me. Now these people are in ancient Egypt. Uh, Ibn Ashur argues that they're Coptics. And the Coptics are a people that consider the master of the house and the kings or whatever. They call them Rabb. They call them Rabb. They call them my master. So when they hear you, Yusuf السلام, say, my master taught me this interpretation. In their mind, the only time they hear the word Rabb like that is for a human master. They don't think of the master for the master of all nations and all people, Allah. They don't think of it like that. Even, even before, you know, إِنَّهُ رَبِّي أَحْسَنَ مَثْوَايَ the, the minister's wife would have thought he's talking about my husband when he said, my master has been good to me in providing housing. Right? So she, she wasn't thinking of Allah. She may have been thinking of the, the, the owner of the house. Here he uses the word Rabb. It's still kind of, it's, it, the, the more of a mystery has been solved one, there was a hint towards where does the food come from. The second time, my master has taught me. But who is this master that taught you? They're like, there's an Egyptian minister that can teach this stuff? We never heard of any such thing. Who is this master of yours? Now he says, listen to this. Now he's getting more and more specific. <inaudible> this is probably the most powerful words of Yusuf a.s. so far in the prison. Like this, this is the, the, the linchpin. This is it. Everything centers around this. He says, I have no doubt left the religion of a people who don't believe in Allah. I have no doubt left the religion of a people that don't believe in Allah. And they, especially when it comes to the afterlife, to the final end, they are the ones that are in complete denial of it. So he says two things about these people. They don't believe in Allah and they are in absolute, absolute denial like nobody else when it comes to the Akhirah. Now, we're going to have to deal with both of those things. But what does he say? I have left. Who did he just leave? He left the minister and he left the minister's wife and he left those women. They, did. they weren't talking about not believing in Allah. They weren't talking about worshipping false gods. They weren't asking him to be an atheist. But they were. You see, you'll find in this, in this surah, in his words, you'll find something is behind what he's saying. He won't say, I left the people that were calling me to disobey Allah. Isn't that what, the, what it was? Most literally, he would say, I have left a people that don't want to obey Allah and wanted me to disobey him. But look at the way he describes that reality. He says, I have left the religion of a people who don't believe in Allah, meaning what you called me to was also a religion. That was also a religion. Just like Islam is a religion, what those women wanted was also a religion. 
And I have left that religion which is based on not believing in Allah. Now Allah is the final authority in our religion, in His religion. Allah is the ultimate object of worship, adoration, obsession even, gratitude, submission. We surrender before Allah. We think about Allah all the time. We remember Allah all the time. Everything we do is influenced by the color of our faith in Allah. Sibghat Allah, man ahsanu min Allah is sibgha. But then there's these people who everything they do, everything they say, everything they want is not colored by their faith in Allah. They have no faith in Allah. But then what is it that they follow? Who, what do they worship? You know, in the Quran elsewhere, Allah says, أَرَأَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَهَهُ هَوَاهُ Have you seen somebody who takes their feelings, their desires, and turns them into their God? How is he describing those people? Now, they, the ancient Egyptians had a religion. They were Copts. So they believed in multiple gods. They actually also believed in an afterlife. That's why even before the pharaoh, no, the pharaoh, pharaonic version of religion, where they had mummification and that was the way they traveled into the afterlife, and when they mummified and you know put them in their corpses or in their, in their um, rather in their tombs, they put treasures with them because they have to take that stuff with them into the next life. Yeah, but he says here they have absolutely no belief in the afterlife. They are absolutely in denial of the afterlife. How can he say that when we know that the Egyptians actually had belief in the afterlife? He's saying, actually, whatever God they believe in, the reality is the only God they believe in is their own desires. And whatever they believe of the afterlife is a myth based on their own desires. It's actually not belief in the afterlife at all. The actual afterlife, they're in complete denial of it. They have no concept of it. When Yusuf السلام, told her, إِنَّهُ لَا يُفْلِحُ الظَّالِمُونَ Wrongdoers never succeed. Was he just talking about success in this life? He was talking about the next life. And that had no, that was not part of the equation at all. That didn't factor into her behavior at all. It wasn't able to sway her even a little bit away from her, what she wanted. This is how, now the thing is, he didn't tell them what happened with those ladies and with the minister's wife and what the minister did. None of that. And by the way, the minister also has a, a false god. His false god is his reputation. And he follows that false god and surrenders to it whatever it wants. Whatever sacrifice needs to be made. We can sacrifice an animal for the sake of Allah. They can sacrifice Yusuf for the sake of their reputation. You understand? So they also have a God that they worship. Even if it's themselves. Even if it's their worship, their, their, their own ego, or their own you know, pride, or their own you know, political, or, or their, their social reputation. Or it's their sense of you know, possessiveness, their sense of power. It could be any of those things. They can become gods on their own. He says, I have abandoned the religion of a people that don't believe in Allah. Now, what he says, I'm telling you what he's saying from his point of view, right? But the amazing thing about Yusuf is he's speaking from his point of view, but he's also aware that the two guys he's talking to don't know the background. So when they hear it from their point of view, they're going to process something different. They're just going to hear, so you don't follow the religion of everybody outside? And you're saying nobody else believes in God and they have no concept of the afterlife. He's, from his point of view, even though the wording is general, it's specific to his story. But from their point of view, he's making a, con a comment about all society in Egypt. You understand? Because he's not being specific about the minister's wife and this and that. And this is what happened to me. No, he's saying, I've left the religion of the larger society. I've, I have nothing to do with it. I've walked away from it. It's been offered to me. It's been put in my, you know, I, I don't have anything to do with it. Which is also, again, really ironic language because he's the one being tossed into prison. He's being tossed into prison and he's talking like, yeah, I chose this because I wanted to walk away from that. And this is actually him describing that this was a deliberate request he made to Allah. Prison is better for me. And he's describing prison is better for me to these young men as what? I walked away from a false religion. That's why I'm here. That's why I chose to be here. I'm actually better off right now because I walked away from that. He's, this is again, by the way, grateful. How do you imagine he's walking into prison, the worst place you could be in Egypt, and the first thing he says is, whew, finally out of trouble, I'm here. I want to tell you what your dream means, but first I want you to know that I consider myself pretty lucky that I 
got away from people who don't believe in Allah in the last day. You know, and then he says, Ibrahim wa Ishaq wa Yaqub. And I have so what have I left? I left them and I didn't follow them. But what I did commit myself to following is the religion of my fathers, Ibrahim, Ishaq, and Yaqub. He brought up his great grandfather, Ibrahim, then he brought up his grandfather, Ishaq, then he brought up his father Yaqub. This should remind you of what happened in the beginning of the story. His father told him, Wakadalika, you know, Yajtabika uh, Rabbuka. That is how your master has chosen you. And he's teaching you to interpret all kinds of speech. He just said, that is from what my master taught me. And the father had said when he was a kid, that God will teach you all kinds of speech, interpretation of all kinds of speech. And he says, And he will complete his favor on you and on the family of Yaqub. Just like he completed it before you on Ibrahim and Ishaq. That conversation he had with his dad as a kid is now coming up almost word for word, phrase for phrase. Allah said he will teach you interpretation of speech. He says, The father said, you know, Yaqub said, Allah has completed his favor on those, those prophets and he's going to complete it on you. He said, and I have followed the religion of my fathers, Ibrahim, Ishaq and Yaqub. What does that tell you? That tells you that the words, we, the words of encouragement and validation, the words of our holding on to our past and our legacy that we give to our children can actually define them as adults. That he's an adult now. And he's not an, he's the last thing you would call this is an Islamic environment. And he is standing with his Islam tall because of a foundation he got when he was a kid. And he's referring back to that foundation. How important are those memories and those conversations that they become imprints on a, on a child's personality all the way into their adulthood? All the way into, into their adulthood. So, I can tell you something personal on this note. So my dad, when he would take, us, uh, take me to Jum'ah ah when I was younger, before he would walk into the masjid, he'd say, the masjid is Allah's house, the khutbah is part of the prayer, so we don't talk, and we show a lot of we show complete respect when we are inside the Jum'a prayer. And he never corrected me. Sometimes I'd be, you know, because the carpets are really entertaining, so you can draw stuff on the carpets with your finger. I don't look at because and the khutbahs were all in Arabic, so I don't understand nothing that's going on, right? But my dad would just sit still and you know, cross his arms and he just sits straight, looking straight, as if he's in the prayer. Like that's how it, like statued he was when he was listening to a khutbah. And I observed him do this over and over. And over time I started copying him. And a habit formed in me that anything can happen, I will never speak during Jum'ah, during khutbah. I won't look around, I won't be distracted, I won't like, you know, it's not like sitting in a speech that's going on at a conference or something or whatever. And I never learned that from an Islamic class. I never learned that from like studying the manners of Jum'ah, etc. It was just my dad and his behavior, and I'm sitting next to him, eight, nine years old, and he's acting this way, and I'm just learning, modeling his behavior. And that became an imprint in my head, to the point where even sometimes khutbah has begun, right? Sometimes I'd come late to the masjid, the khutbah the imam has started, but people know me in the community. And you know, people don't know the manners of khutbah. So they come to you during khutbah, it's on the mic, you're all the way in the back coming in, hey, brother Naman, assalamu alaikum. You're like, not going to say it, because the Jum'ah khutbah started. But that didn't come to me because I read the hadith on the subject or the mannerisms. None of that. My dad even, didn't even refer to them. It was because the mannerism he put in place. What I'm trying to tell you is there are certain practices, certain things that we can leave as an imprint on our children. And this is the imprint he's left for him. Now the other important part of it is, what is the imprint that he left for him? That you follow a religion that has a legacy. And that legacy goes all the way back to who? Ibrahim alayhi salam, and that's important. It starts with Ibrahim, and now the tipping point of it is himself, right? The two ends of this legacy are Ibrahim and then Yusuf. So, so far in this story. Now this is also important, because why? Ibrahim alayhi salam also away from his father. Ibrahim alayhi salam also on his own as a young man. Ibrahim alayhi salam also being willing to be thrown into a fire and not let go of his religion. Yes or no? So he's, Ibrahim alayhi salam is the model of holding on to Allah when the entire society around you wants to let go of Allah. Nobody wants to follow Allah except 
you, and this is the religion of Ibrahim السلام, it doesn't depend on society's trends to become more committed or less committed. And he says, I have the honor of following the legacy of my, and the religion of my fathers, Ibrahim, Ishaq, and Yaqub. And these inmates, these two guys, have no idea who these people are. They don't have any, they're Copts. They're Coptic Egyptians. They're like, who? Uh, he thought he's going to mention some noble family lineage of the pharaohs or something else or some other, you know, great clans of Egypt. No, he says, no, I have followed the religion of my fathers, Ibrahim, Ishaq, and Yaqub. Who? Oh, you don't know? Okay, well, I'll tell you. So he's creating curiosity, right? And he's introducing them. And he's introducing them as what? His own family. You know what's really beautiful about that? They're literally his family, right? They're literally his family. What does Allah say about Ibrahim alayhi salam for us? Millata abikum Ibrahim. Listen to the phrase, the religion of your father Ibrahim, all of you. Allah calls Ibrahim alayhi salam our father. And he calls Islam the religion of all of your father, Ibrahim. Spiritually, Ibrahim alayhi salam is not just a prophet for us, he's also our father. So actually we share that with Yusuf alayhi salam. He's the, he's the father, Ibrahim is his father by blood. And Ibrahim alayhi salam is our father by iman. And Allah called him ima, our father also. Millata abikum Ibrahim. In other words, this aspect of da'wah, to cling on to the legacy of our father Ibrahim, is something we can share with people, just like he shared it with these two young men that have no idea who that is, right? This is also telling us that one of the most beautiful ways to introduce people to Islam is actually to introduce them to our father Ibrahim alayhi salam. That's one of the most beautiful, because he's a man discovering his faith, right? And he's seeking and he's finding that answer and then he becomes the patriarch and he becomes the pillar for how to understand all of Islam, all of it, down to the, you know, the most fundamental symbol of Islam, the Kaaba itself, goes back to Ibrahim alayhi salam, right? So actually one of the most amazing ways to introduce anybody to Islam is to actually go back to our father Ibrahim alayhi salam. And that's something we're learning from Yusuf alayhi salam. So he says, I've, I've left their religion, who don't believe in Allah in the last day, but I followed the religion of my fathers, Ibrahim, Ishaq, and Yaqub. And you know, in this religion of ours, let me tell you, what is that noble legacy? I come from a noble heritage. Can you imagine someone in jail talking about a noble heritage? I come from, you know, high, higher clan. What makes us such a high clan? What makes us so honorable? It's not people. Ibrahim alayhi salam didn't leave behind a palace. The Egyptians have palaces. Ishaq alayhi salam does not have cities named after him. Yaqub alayhi salam does not have monuments that he's going to leave behind. He doesn't have any of that. You know, people that consider successful people that left a mark in the world or history, they think of things that they did materially. Conquest, wealth, something. This is how you say you come from a big family. You're the Rockefellers. You know, you come from a family of billionaires. You come from a family of accomplishers. You come from a family of presidents, of generals, of whatever. You know. How, what, what's so great about this family? He says, مَا كَانَ لَنَا أَن نُشْرِكَ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ it has never been okay. We, it wasn't possible for us, meaning me and my fathers, to ever have associated anything with Allah in any way, shape, or form. We could never put anything next to Allah equated with Allah ever. We couldn't do that. You see, now there's a furthering of the argument. Before we saw, they don't, I have left to people that don't believe in Allah and they deny the afterlife, right? They don't believe in Allah. Now he's saying, let me tell you, not believing in Allah doesn't just mean I don't believe Allah exists. You could believe Allah exists and still put something equal to Allah. And it doesn't have to be an idol. It could be your own temptations. It doesn't have to be an idol. It could be your own greed. It doesn't have to be an idol. It could be, you know, friends. It could be a person. So anyone who gets in the way of what Allah is saying and what someone else is saying becomes higher, bigger priority. Even if it's your own thoughts, they become bigger priority. Is that not shirk? So he says, it wasn't okay for us. It wasn't possible for us to ever have associated anything with Allah in any way, shape, or form. ذَلِكَ مِنْ فَضْلِ اللَّهِ عَلَيْنَا That is from the favor of Allah on all of us. Meaning me, myself, and my family. The word from is important. مِنْ فَضْلِ اللَّهِ Meaning this is part of the favor Allah has done to us. He's done us many other favors too. Then when you say, by the way, this great favor that we have never done shirk with Allah. We, we keep our faith in God extremely pure. Now, by the way, he's mentioned Allah by name. 
He didn't before, he said Rabbi, my master, but now he's calling him Allah. So he's introducing them to Allah by name now. And he's saying, Allah, our master, that, the one who taught me, the one who provides food, is the one I would never equate anybody with. And that's an honor Allah has given me that I never cross the line with him. It's an honor to worship him. And that's a favor Allah has done. This is part of the favor Allah has done on me and on my entire family. وَعَلَيْنَا You know, so مِنْ فَضْلِ اللَّهِ عَلَيْنَا Now, why is that important? This is important because he's saying all the other favors that you might wonder. The two inmates might wonder, oh, so that's the favor of Allah on us? On you? What other favors are there? Because you say that's only some of the favor. And he says, yeah, well, all the other favors that come, come from this. Once you decide that Allah is for you the highest authority, the only object of adoration and love and worship and every other feeling you have must submit to His will first. Must be in the shade of what He approves. If you, if you acknowledge that, then the doors of Allah's blessing keep opening and opening and opening. And by the way, He already mentioned one of His favors, I have the ability to interpret your dreams. And that favor of Allah could never have come to me if I didn't accept Allah as my only master that I would never do shirk with him. And by the way, this favor is not just for my family, Ibrahim, Ishaq, Yaqub, myself. It's not just for us. He doesn't even say he's a prophet yet, does he? No. He says, this is a favor of Allah, part of the favor of Allah on us and on all people. How beautiful. He said, by the way, this favor isn't just something Allah gave me. He gave it to all people. What's he trying to tell them? You can have this favor too. You can have Allah shower favors on you. And they say, we could have wisdom like that. We could have knowledge like that. We could feel honored and noble. This is not just a family thing. This is something that's inside of people's hearts. And then he says, yeah, and you know, all people can have access to this favor. However, most people just aren't grateful. And that's the last, the last thing he says. Most people are not grateful is him coming back to the same concept where I started. When he walked into prison, the first thing he said is, I'm grateful that I left the people who don't believe. He, and I told you, the only thing that makes someone have hold on to their faith patiently is actually gratitude. Gratitude leads to patience. Without gratitude, you can't have patience. And so he says most people aren't grateful as if if people started becoming grateful, Allah's favors would start opening up to them. Their doors would start opening up to them. He's actually, in a sense, giving them an, a, a very beautiful hint that you can also become grateful to Allah. And He's also telling them, maybe if you don't accept Allah, the, the highest crime isn't that you reject Allah or that you disobey Allah. The biggest crime is, starting from your food, you're just not grateful. You know, the whole Qur'an begins with gratitude. Why? Because, you know, human beings in philosophy have always sought to answer this question, the purpose of life, the meaning of life. But the Qur'an has a new take on the purpose and meaning of life. Whether or not, should we or should we not be grateful for what we have? And if we should be grateful for what we have, if we have privileges as human, the human race, if we have certain privileges, certain advantages that no other species enjoys, then should that credit go somewhere? Should we think that we owe, and we say grateful, people now, nowadays, it's interesting, the way grateful is used nowadays. Atheists use the word grateful. I'm really grateful that I'm safe. I'm really grateful that the, the stock market's not crashing anymore, whatever. They use the word grateful like that. But the question is, when you say you're grateful, you left it half, halfway. Grateful to who? Grateful to who? Like, who are you thanking? And this is actually the pur most purposeful question in the quest of humanity. It's not even the logical proofs of the existence of God. The Qur'an's argument actually is human beings fundamentally need to, uh, need to ask themselves whether or not they owe thanks. And that question will lead them down a road of inquiry and discovery and wisdom that will lead them back to Allah. But it's really, لَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَشْكُرُونَ most people just aren't grateful. He didn't say most people don't believe, most people aren't convinced, most people don't know. That's coming later. But he says, no, the fundamental problem is most people are not grateful. They just live their life, they eat their food, they don't even think about where it came from. Like turzaqani, it's not turzaqani, it's just ta'am. It's just food, it's not being provided. It's just food, I'll just eat it. 
food that I eat, not food that I was provided. Because when you say I was provided, you got to think about where, who provided it. You got to go back, you know. So he's, and then knowledge that I, I, I could have interpreted this dream to you. And I could have told you, yeah, I'm pretty good at that. He says, no, my master taught it to me. Who did he give gratitude to for the knowledge that he's about to impress them with? Is Allah. And the fact that I can interpret it so quickly, before lunch even gets here, is because my master taught me. But notice also, first of all, he didn't stall them. I'm going to leave you guys with this one. It's pretty funny, actually. One time, we were, my friends and I, we were in college. The year was 1875. Um, we were going to this Islamic convention in Pennsylvania, I remember, okay, on a road trip from New York. And we, st we couldn't, it was getting late for Asr, so we go decide to stop, find a masjid somewhere. So we look it up on whatever and find a masjid and go there. It's completely empty. We go pray Asr there and this fellow, you know, prays with us. He's a local, like, uh, so he's the only one who was there in the masjid. And so he led the prayer. We pray behind him and he says, do you brothers have a little bit of time? So we said we were on a we're on a road trip, and uh, you know we were trying to catch. Uh, there's a convention going on. Mashallah, it's an Islamic convention. Yeah, it's an Islamic convention. Mashallah, Mashallah. You have a couple of minutes. I'd like to share something with you. We were, okay, so we already told him that we're trying to get somewhere for Maghrib. We already told him that you know we're going to an Islamic convention, not to a party. Uh, and then the fellow he said, "You have a couple of minutes. I'd like to share something." We said, "A couple of minutes. That's cool. Let's do it." The next hour and a half was his couple of minutes. And he was talking to us about the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how grateful we should be and how humble we should be and how we should be doing istighfar. And he just, it was a great talk. It was 90 minutes. But you know the problem with it? The guys were just staring at each other for a while. And he could see, there's not 80 of us, there's six of us. So sometimes they're just, some of these guys are less subtle. Like I, I can just listen and hold it in. Some of these guys are like, <sighs> like that's not a, not a very subtle way of letting someone know that <laughs> please stop we got it some other guys pretend to go to the bathroom they go behind him and they're like you know let's trickle out one at a time <laughs> and I have to subtly say no it's rude the problem with all of it though is you have to be considerate of other people's time. You, can, you want to give da'wah. I mean, in his mind, he's doing da'wah for the sake of Allah. And he's, you know, giving us the message and all of that 90 minutes in. Um, and he just said, oh, it's Maghrib, we should pray. And then he was going to ask for another couple of minutes. So we prayed and we quickly, you know, combined our prayers and we got out of there. And we said, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Before he could talk, we, we started with the salam. So that way we preempted, preemptive strike. And then you get, <laughs> get out. <laughs> the problem is, you don't want to give a lot. They, you know, we came there to pray. We came for a purpose. And we have another purpose. If you try to inconvenience someone by giving them the message of Islam, and you think you're doing the da'wah to Islam, there's a problem with that. And if you want to take the time to give someone a message, which Yusuf Islam wants to do, right? He wants to give them a message. And I've taken like an hour or something to explain some things from these ayat to you. But actually, if you recite these ayat, it will take 30, 45 seconds. Like the message that he delivered was a minute, one minute. And then he got to the point what they asked about. You understand? Like he didn't, he didn't sit them down and give them like three khutbahs. And then after that, now I'll tell you. First of all, he said, by the way, I understand that you're anxious about this dream and you want to know about it. And I'm telling you before lunch gets here, you'll know. So first he consoled them. Look, I care about what you're doing and I care that your time is valuable. I understand that your time is valuable. I respect your time. That's the remarkable thing about this conversation, right? So first he respected their time. He didn't want to just sit them down and hammer them with something over and over and over again. And they're like, bro, that's not what we came here for. I just wanted to know what my dream meant. He's like, no, I'll tell you about your dream. And I'll tell you because someone taught me. My master taught me. And I would never have known my master had I not been from this incredible family. And this family of mine has been favored by our, my teacher, also my master, the one I worship, Allah. But that favor isn't just limited to me, it's open to all of humanity. But most people just aren't grateful. Like, you see how beautifully he's woven in what he's building up to, the, 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 the conversation he's going to have? He's going to say a couple more things that he's going to get more direct with them. Just I want you to think about something. Just food for thought for you guys. Before you, 
and I'll tell you what your dream means, but I want you to consider some things. And he's going to ask them to consider some things, and then he's going to tell them very quickly what that dream means, and he's done. He's not like, and I'd love to tell you, but um, maybe tomorrow after another couple of lectures, then I'll tell you. He doesn't do that. And that's one of the most beautiful things about this, this, this exchange is actually the respect for people's time. I shouldn't be so concerned about forcing someone to sit down and having them listen to what I say. If somebody wants to hear, they'll hear. But if I have an elevator pitch opportunity, if I have a 30-second opportunity, if I have an opportunity at a grocery store or at an airport or somewhere else where I get a split-second chance to talk to somebody or a coworker during lunch, to talk, did something came up and I have a split second chance to share something with them, I don't have to wait, let me go over the entire khutbah that I heard and repeat the whole thing. You don't have to do that. Just drop a little bit, whatever you can, whatever is appropriate for that time, and then walk away. That's good enough. That's all you have to do. You don't have to overdo it. You know? So, khatibun nas ala qadri uqulim li kulli kalam or maqal maqam. Every speech has a time and place. You know, talk to people at their level and, you know, being considerate of them. And that's something that Yusuf Alayhisam demonstrates very beautifully. And there's so much to say here, but at least one thing I will say is, these are prison inmates. They ain't got nowhere to go. It's not like they got an appointment with the president. Like, they, they don't have that kind of schedule. So they sit around all day in a cell, and yet he respects their time. Isn't that incredible? You know what that means? You don't get to decide whose time is valuable. You assume everyone's time is valuable. You don't get to decide, well, you, go, you don't got better, nothing better to do anyway, so you are going to have the privilege of listening to me talk to you. Rather, you're going to consider it an honor that they gave you a few minutes of their time for you to do an act of worship and share something about Allah. You're not doing them a favor. In a sense, they're doing you a favor. And could you allow me this favor of sharing something beneficial with you before food gets here? It's really quite beautiful. It's, it's manners. It's consideration. It's, con, you know, it's the importance given to someone else. Often when I, when I started my speaking career, I'd be invited to go to you know, conventions and lectures and things like that. And sometimes in a convention there's 20,000 people, 15,000 people, 35,000 people. And you're walking around and people are just treating you like a VIP, like they want to take a picture with you. Can I just have a minute of your time? I know you're really busy. Like, like there's this like, um, like we have, the speaker has honored them with his presence. No. Anybody who speaks about Allah and has the honor and the privilege to get to speak about Allah is actually doing something to serve Allah and serve the people that got to hear something beneficial. They're not honored by listening to him or her, he's honored that they gave him or her an ear. It's the, it's the other way around. Just like when you give sadaqah, the charity, the one who was in need, you didn't honor them, you didn't favor them, they favored you. It's the same exact principle. It's the same, same exact principle. So sometimes, you know, what I try to do, you know, in, in events and things that I went to, speech, the speech takes 20 minutes and they haul you away into a VIP room. Right, in the speaker's lounge when they have fruits and whatever else. And I was like, ah. So I stayed in the crowd. I'd stay in the crowd. And people just want to talk or ask questions or whatever. And I'd stay until 1, 2 a.m. just answering questions because people just want to talk or have questions. And the reason I did that is because the least I can do, these people have honored me by listening to hundreds of hours of me, thousands of hours. They've made du'as for me. They've spent Ramadans with me. They've prayed and then they've put my voice on. I didn't deserve that. So if I get a chance to maybe hear them out and say some, some, ask some questions, or maybe even hear a dua, I'll hear it. I, I'm not too busy for that. You know, It's their time that's valuable, not mine. Because actually they're the ones that are doing me a favor by helping me get some sadaqah jariya. That's the, that's the mindset that has to develop for, for anybody who's going to share something good. It does not put us in a superior position. Yes, you are honored. Look at Ibrahim, Yusuf Aysam. He's so honored that he comes from this noble family and how he's favored. And then he says, and yet this favor is open to? Wa'ala nas. It's open to all people. Well, most people just aren't grateful. You know? So we, may Allah make us from the grateful. And may Allah Azza wa Jal help us you know, see 
that people around us that we have a chance to share something good with are actually a favor of Allah on us. We should treat them that way. We should treat them with respect. We should treat them with courtesy. We should treat, respect their time and not, and not impose our time on them. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikri al-Hakim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.